Welcome to Nebraska Union this afternoon for our Nebraska lecture, the first of our lecture series for the 2018 year. My name is Ronnie Green and I have the privilege of serving as the 20th Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Lincoln. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. This lecture serves as a very important way to share our research and scholarship of the university with our community and stakeholders. And it's a great, what we refer to often as town and gown kind of event for us involving partners across the city. The Nebraska Lectures are an interdisciplinary research lecture series designed to bring together our university community with the greater community and beyond to celebrate the intellectual life of our university. These presentations highlight our faculty's excellence in research, scholarship, and creative activity across disciplines. This lecture series is sponsored by the university's research council in cooperation with the chancellor's office, the Office of Research and Economic Development, and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, better known as OLLI. I want to extend our thanks also especially to Humanities Nebraska, and we happen to have the executive director, Chris Summerich. I think Chris is here, back here. Thank you, Chris. And Humanities Nebraska for being a partner with us as well. Also want to give a warm big red welcome to campus today to members of the Willow Cather Foundation who traveled from Red Cloud in South Central Nebraska for this lecture. We greatly appreciate your support and interest. So please give a round of applause to all these partners of our lecture. Today's lecture is be, being streamed live, so I also want to thank everyone for joining us online for the opportunity and through Facebook Live. For social media users, the hashtag for today's lecture is hashtag NEB lecture, N-E-B lecture. If you're joining us on any social media channels, I encourage you to tell us which Willow Cather novel made the biggest impact on you and why. A few words about today's format and housekeeping up front before we introduce our lecturer. Uh, after the lecture is concluded, Dr. Mohammed Dahab from our College of Engineering, chair of the university's research council, will moderate a Q&A session with the audience and our lecturer. Afterwards, you can please feel free to join us for a reception in the Heritage Room across the hallway here in the Union. Our research council deserves special recognition today. The council involves faculty from a broad range of disciplines across the campus, and one of their many roles is soliciting nominations for our Nebraska lecture series. Being selected as a speaker, as a Nebraska lecturer, is the highest recognition the council can bestow on any individual faculty member in the university community, and is awarded on the basis of major recent accomplishments and the speaker's ability to really communicate and to share uh, her or his work. Now it's great pleasure for me today to introduce our first 2018 Nebraska lecturer, our distinguished speaker, Andrew Jewell. Andy is a professor in the university libraries and a faculty member in our acclaimed Center for Digital Research in the Humanities. He's a true modern scholar with the ability to present academic information in new and very exciting ways and formats. I'm excited about today's lecture because Andy is a leading expert on one of our very most famous alums, Willa Cather. Cather spent most of her childhood, as you know, in Red Cloud, Nebraska. It was mentioned earlier and graduated from the University of Nebraska in 1895. She started her career as a journalist and was a successful editor for many years uh, before she became a full-time author in midlife, eventually winning a Pulitzer Prize. One of her most well-known themes was the reality of life here on the Great Plains in this place, in this space that we think of as our home. This was a topic her peers hadn't explored, but she understood it very deeply and at a personal level. Andy has devoted his career to studying Cather's literary contributions. Because of his scholarship, we have a richer understanding of who Cather was as a person and why her work has stood the test of time. 
Many of the themes in Ms. Cather's work, including immigration, the environment, and women's issues, those sound familiar to you? <laughs> Still very relevant today in our discussions and our dialogue. Andy joined the university as a faculty member in 2005 and is editor of the Willa Cather Archive, a rich online resource of Cather's writing, plus images and other multimedia. The archive contains a comprehensive section of Cather's personal correspondence. Cather fans in the room are likely using this resource already, but if you're new to this topic, I encourage you to visit cather.unl. Edu. In addition to editing the archive, Andy is co-editor of the Selected Letters of Willa Cather and the American Literature Scholar in the Digital Age. Andy earned his bachelor's degree from Hastings College, uh, one of our sister universities here in the state, a master's from the University of Missouri at Columbia, and a doctorate from UNL. And if you read the UNL Today little piece on the lecture this morning, you might have picked up that he actually didn't read Cather, right? I've mean, probably taken away some of your script here, but didn't, <laughs> didn't read Cather as a, as a high school student or a student here in Nebraska growing up in North Platte or when he was at Hastings. It was until he went to Mizzou, of all places, that, <laughs> that he was first exposed uh, to Willow's writings. So it's now my honor to introduce our colleague, Andy Jewell, who will present our Cather heritage. Please join me in welcoming. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much to the Research Council, to the Office of Research and Economic Development, and to Chancellor Green for the invitation and the kind introduction. And thank you to all of you who are here today or who are listening via the webcast and watching via the webcast. And I want to make special mention and thanks to four people who gave me encouragement and advice as I prepared this lecture. Thank you to Erica Dufresne, to Kevin McMullen, to Emily Rao, and especially to Becca Jewell for their help. I am honored that you've invited me to speak to you about my work. In doing so, you're really complimenting a collaborative team of which I'm so proud to be a part, several teams. I'm lucky to have a lot of terrific colleagues and I want to take a moment to thank, acknowledge, and name them. First, the team that creates the online Willa Cather archive, who lately have been heroically working on the ambitious Complete Letters of Willa Cather digital edition. Melissa Homestead, professor of English, whose diligent research skills and insightful critical perspectives provide a high standard for all of us. And Kari Ronning, research professor of English, whose depth of knowledge and commitment has dramatically enriched both this project and the whole of Cather scholarship and Emily Rao, the assistant editor of the Cather Archive, who has quickly grown to become a leader on the project and who brings her intelligence, dedication, and good-naturedness to all aspects of our work. Graduate research assistants Gabby Kirilov, Jess Katibo, and Katerina Bernardini have offered creativity, experience, skill, and energy that has enabled this product to take shape and undergraduate researchers like Samantha Greenfield, Lori Nevely, and Emma Himes have been crucial contributors, gamely providing support and assistance in a wide variety of ways. All of these people have made my professional life richer and more satisfying through their labor and their friendship. The Cather Archive is supported by the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities, and I also want to thank the creative, innovative work of that team, particularly Karen Dalzell, Jessica DeSalt, and Greg Tunnink. Their work is a model of productive collaboration. Their experience and expertise building digital projects deeply informs what the Cather Archive and our Complete Letters project becomes. We bring different perspectives to our collaboration, and we learn from one another to create a new publication that is better, more powerful, and more resilient than it would be if we had worked independently. I have such gratitude to be able to work with thoughtful, imaginative people, and I deeply appreciate the support of the center co-directors, Catherine Walter and Kenneth Price, that they, that, that the support they have given to the Willa Cather Archive. And finally, I want to acknowledge the university libraries, my home at UNL. I'm honored to be a faculty member in the libraries, where there is a deep commitment to the university mission and a diverse, multidisciplinary community. Its campus-wide support of teaching and research, of access to the cultural record, and of innovative publications and services is something I deeply admire. 
My work depends upon an institution that supports both preservation of unique materials and creative efforts to make those materials available and meaningful to a broader audience. The university libraries is that institution, and it provides a core intellectual infrastructure that allows my work and the work of most faculty, staff, and students on campus to come into being. Our Cather Heritage. The idea and title for this lecture comes from something that happened in Red Cloud, Nebraska in 1962. John Nyhart, the poet laureate of the state, was invited to dedicate the new Willa Cather Museum in the Garber, Garber Bank Building on Webster Street. He said in his dedication, quote, it is usual, I believe, to regard such ceremonies as being concerned with honor paid to the dead, and yet those whom we call the dead can need nothing that we who linger here a little while can give. He continued, quote, it is for us, the living, and for the living who shall follow us, generation after generation, that we set this Willa Cather Memorial against the flowing years, lest we forget the precious heritage that is ours through her. I first read this dedication a few years ago as I was preparing to talk about my work editing Willa Cather's letters at the 2015 Nyhart Conference in Bancroft, Nebraska. Almost immediately I thought, at some level this is what my work is all about. My colleagues and I work to edit and publish Cather's correspondence because we believe there is something in it for the living that is worth knowing, worth remembering. But in making this connection, I was left with a question. What is, to quote Nyhart, the precious heritage that is ours through her? What are we inheriting? What is worth knowing? This lecture is my personal response to this question as to why I feel the life and work of Willa Cather deserves the years of attention I and others have given to it. I hope too that what I have to say underscores another point. Scholarship that focuses on an individual life need not be a narrowing of vision, but can be and should be a way to expand one's vision. This is especially true when the life is a creative one that leaves behind a body of work which broadly considers the human condition. Through close study of the life and work, there's revelation of nuance and connection and detail of the complex cultures and histories that form our experience and our values. The more I learn about Cather, the more I realize how much I do not know and can perhaps never know. In this way, her life is like each human life, formed in a complicated system of expectations and evaluations, responsive to particular experiences and predilections, and lived both in the privacy of the mind and in the exposure of relationship. But in another way, Willa Cather is exceptional, a woman of incredible gifts who has created works of meaning for a huge number of readers across a broad span of time. These works, My Antonia, The Professor's House, Death Comes for the Archbishop, Old Mrs. Harris, and so many more, are still living and resonating creations. Her life story, too, is a narrative that connects with many people as it contains elements that speak to different audiences at different times. Born in Virginia in 1873, she moved with her family to South Central Nebraska when she was nine years old. Initially devastated by the move and the bewildering landscape, she grew to love the people and the prairie that surrounded them, befriending neighbors that had come to Nebraska from a variety of states and countries. Intellectually gifted and independently minded, she refused the trappings of late 19th century femininity, cut her hair short, studied Latin and Greek, and planned to become a doctor. At the University of Nebraska, she discovered her vocation as a writer, writing fiction, poetry, and reviews for student publications and the local newspaper. After graduation in 1895, she soon started her first career as a journalist, moving to Pittsburgh and later New York to work on newspapers and magazines as an editor and writer. In 1912, soon after her first novel was published, she left her well-paying job at McClure's Magazine to be a professional writer. She was 38 years old. For most of her adult life, Willa Cather lived in New York with her partner, Edith Lewis, who was an, advertising, an editor and advertising copywriter. From that home base, she traveled the country and the world, often coming back for extended periods to be with her family in Red Cloud, Nebraska, and produced a dozen novels and a few collections of short fiction and essays. 
She took the time she needed to create the book she envisioned, and she created a body of work that is remarkable for its consistent high quality. By the end of her life in 1947, she was widely celebrated as one of the most important and influential writers in the United States. And in a decade since her death, her stature has continued to grow. I am an advocate for this stature, for the value Cather and her work offers us today. I think, as Nyhart noted, there is a precious heritage that is ours through her. I have identified five categories, values or realizations that have been learned or reinforced by my study of Willa Cather, which express core elements of that heritage as I understand it today. And for the rest of this lecture, I want to consider these five inheritances that I have received, that we all can receive from the life and work of Willa Cather. Number one, diverse cultural practices enrich our lives. Willa Cather lived in and advocated for a world where multiple cultural traditions coexisted in close proximity. Living and working in decades that witnessed an enormous influx of immigrants from Europe and other parts of the world, Cather actively resisted the efforts in some circles to standardize American identity. She did not want a melting pot where multiple traditions are dissolved into a characterless mass, but a transnational country, to use Randolph Bourne's term. Her transnational vision meant she advocated for the preservation of cultures, including and perhaps especially those cultures that originated outside the United States. She saw in the multiplicity of cultural identity in American society that would be richer, deeper, and more meaningful to all. And she connected this vision to her own role as a creative artist. In the fall of 1921, Cather visited Nebraska, and while here she lectured on standardization and art in Omaha, underscoring the preservation and celebration of diverse cultural practices as key to creating rich artistic work. She specifically called out Nebraska, the Nebraska legislature for prohibiting the instruction of foreign languages for young children. The newspapers quoted her, will it make a boy or girl any less American to know one or two other languages? She asked, art can find no place in such an atmosphere as these laws create. Art must have freedom. She continued, the Americanization committee worker who persuades an old bohemian housewife that it is better for her to feed her family out of tin cans instead of cooking them a steaming goose for dinner is committing a crime against art. <laughs> Cather's art recreates this transnational vision on the page repeatedly throughout her career. Her novels set in the Midwest unfold in cosmopolitan communities. Swedes, Bohemians, French Canadians, Danes, Russians, Mexicans, Germans, Norwegians, and Virginians all populate Cather's Great Plains. And each of them proudly bring with them ways of life established in different lands. As an example, consider this brief late scene in her book, My Antonia. The narrator, Jim Burden, now in middle age, has returned to Nebraska to reconnect with friends of his past, especially Antonia Shimerda Kuzak. While touring her, her fruit cellar, Jim has this exchange with one of her children. Show him the spice plums, mother. Americans don't have those, said one of the older boys. Mother uses them to make kolaches, he added. Leo, in a low voice, tossed off some scornful remark in Bohemian. I turned to him. You think I don't know kolaches are? What I don't, I don't know what kolaches are, eh? You're mistaken, young man. I've eaten your mother's kolaches long before that Easter day when you were born. The Kuzak boys, speaking in this passage, born in Nebraska, identify as Czech and see Jim Burden as an American who doesn't know their culture and food ways. Jim Burden, though, declares Kalachi part of his own heritage, schooling the boys that his heritage is not only the Anglo-Americanism of the Burden family, but the cosmopolitan transnational reality of the Nebraska prairie in the 1880s. There is a context to the seemingly minor scene in the novel that underscores Cather's commitment to cultural pluralism. Cather started writing My Antonia in 1916 and finished it in 1918, the year it was published. The novel was created in the context of a world war. In the public anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner mood that followed it in the United States, lawmakers forbid foreign language instruction, people perceived to be foreign or sympathetic to foreigners lost their jobs, there are public demonstrations against specific immigrant communities, especially German Americans, and prominent politicians denounced Americans who found part of their identity in their family's country of origin. There was an effort by some to Americanize our diverse nation, what Cather defined as trying to turn immigrant communities into, quote, stupid replicas of smug American citizens. 
This passion for Americanizing everything and everybody, she said, is a deadly disease with us. Into this context, she created a narrative that valued and celebrated a variety of transported cultural traditions, and especially the way those different perspectives and practices enriched the lives of the community. When Jim Burden proudly claims his knowledge of Kalachi, Cather makes a claim too. According to the Oxford English Dictionary and the Dictionary of American Regional English, this scene is the introduction of the word Kalachi into the English language. In choosing the precise Czech word rather than a vague description as she had in O Pioneers a few years before, she argues for presence. Antonia and her family's specific traditions are part of the 20th century American life, even as they simultaneously echo life in 19th century Bohemia. As Cather and her work matured, her commitment to cultural pluralism broadened to include more than European traditions. Her novel, Death Comes to the Archbishop, published in 1927, is set in the American Southwest in the 19th century among intersecting Native American, Mexican, and European American communities. In one scene, the central character, Bishop Jean Latour, is on a journey with Jacinto, a Picos man who served as his guide. Around a campfire, they talk about a number of things, including the different names each of their cultures use for the stars above their heads. Cather writes, the two companions sat, each thinking his own thoughts as night closed in about them, a blue night set with stars, the bulk of the solitary mesas cutting into the firmament. The bishop seldom questioned Jacinto about his thoughts or belief. He didn't think it polite, and he believed it to be useless. There was no way in which he could transfer his own memories of European civilization into the Indian mind, and he was quite willing to believe that behind Jacinto there was a long tradition, a story of experience which no language could translate to him. There is embedded in this passage the twin values that are crucial to Cather's embrace of cultural pluralism, respect and humility. The respect is present both for one's own cultural history and identity, for the richness of those practices, but also for others' identities, which cannot be easily perceived. The humility comes from the recognition and acceptance that we do not and cannot fully know the experiences of another, and that despite that lack of access, we can value it and can believe in it. We demonstrate respect in part by acknowledging our own ignorance, by humbly accepting that we have very much to learn and that we can never know it all. Our differences are real, but we can be comfortable with them. We can connect across them. <coughs> Number two, our lives are embedded in communities. For several years now, I've been actively working as one of the editors on Willa Cather's letters. This past January, we began the publication of the Complete Letters of Willa Cather, a digital scholarly edition published on the Willa Cather Archive website, as you heard. As part of our approach to editing all 3,079 currently known letters available, we are, among other things, keeping track of all the people Cather mentioned in her correspondence. We're about halfway through the project right now, and we've identified around 1,700 individuals mentioned. For each of these people, our editorial team is writing a brief biographical annotation. Over 1,000 have been researched and created, and some of the people referenced are, of course, relatively well-known in the world. Winston Churchill, Mabel Dodge Lewin, Charles Lindbergh, Sarah Orne Jewett. But most of the people Cather mentions in her letters are not famous people with Wikipedia entries. They are family members, neighbors, and friends. The short biographies written by the editorial team, a group effort led by my colleagues Melissa Homestead and Kari Ronning, will be in most cases the only widely available information about these people. The work is making invisible lives from the past visible again, at least in glimpses. These references to people in her letters suggest the huge volume of individual connections that filled Cather's life. The correspondence documents thousands of social interactions, both in person and via letters, that shaped Cather's experiences and perspectives. The vision of Cather one gets through editing her letters is a vision of a woman always living in relationship to another. Her choices and behaviors, her very ways of thinking and writing, are responses to other people who populated her lived experience. This vision is especially striking when one considers that the characterization of Cather that has dominated in the past several decades has been one of an extremely private woman who sacrificed her personal life in service to her art. Influenced by the relative inaccessibility of her correspondence and a private life that did not conform to heteronormative expectations, 
Biographers often have seen her as aloof and isolated. Such a view seems impossible to me now. Our research into Cather's associations reveal life that is embedded simultaneously in multiple communities. Even in her last decade, when Cather had significant emotional struggles and desire for a life that was uninterrupted by unwelcome intrusions, she was not alone. She was with her partner, Edith Lewis. She was with her nieces and nephews and friends. She was visiting the library and traveling to Maine. She was going to concerts and writing letters to dozens of different people. And sometimes she was in a quiet room by herself, writing fiction that reflected the meaning of her relationships to different people in her life. To study Willa Cather is not to look, look narrowly at only one person, but to use an individual life as a point of orientation when considering a web of associations and interactions. Cather's works of fiction underscore this point. Though several books present strong central characters that dominate our memories of them, they are not, for the most part, meditations on isolated psychologies, but narratives of people in relationship. Cather's 1915 novel, The Song of the Lark, for example, is on one hand, Cather's most traditional narrative of a single character, Thea Kronborg, growing up and developing into a major artist. Cather's way of telling it, though, is to highlight the way Kronborg's community actively supported, provoked, and enabled her growth. And in the final scenes of the singer's triumph, Cather populates the audience with people who have helped her in different ways along the path. Her point? Thea Kronborg didn't do this alone. Her seeming isolation in the artist's life is a smokescreen for the rich interplay of relationship that is the more foundational reality. The editing of Willa Cather's letters is an exploration of hundreds of lives which inform and shape Cather's life. life. Lives like Albert Donovan's. He was a student of Cather's when she taught high school in Pittsburgh in 1904, who stayed in touch and then introduced her to fellow soldiers when he returned home from World War I introductions that informed her book, One of Ours, which won the Pulitzer Prize. And who, in the 1930s, lived around the corner from Cather on the Upper East Side of New York with his partner, Hugh Clark, and hosted, even hosted a wedding reception for Cather's niece. Or lives like Lucille Gurney Guise. She was a young woman in Red Cloud, Nebraska, the daughter of farmers who worked in a lawyer's office and later helped care for that lawyer when he was paralyzed and widowed. She married a young man in 1940 when she was 22 years old and then died soon after from an appendix operation. Cather knew her as a lovely girl who would help her when she wanted to send flowers to old friends in town. Or consider Peoriana Elizabeth Bogardus Sill, an educated woman who studied art and music in Europe in the 19th century and then moved to Nebraska, eventually ending up in Red Cloud where she taught music lessons and directed Willa Cather in a production of Beauty and the Beast. When Cather was 15, she wrote that she liked to spend a lot of time with Mrs. Still, as she was, quote, at least an imitation of the things I most lack. She wished to see Europe like Mrs. Sill. She admitted, but, quote, when I return, I don't want my whole life to be a European souvenir. <laughs> it is true that Cather valued quiet days and time to herself to reflect, work, and just be. She did not always want to go to parties or give lectures. It is simultaneously true that she was perpetually experiencing life in the midst of relationship with others. From birth to death, her whole life was formed by the context of its communities and the tension and pressures of that context. And she knew it. In an essay on the author Catherine Mansfield, first published in 1925, Cather wrote, one realizes that even in harmonious families, there is this double life, the group life, which is the one we can observe in our neighbor's household and underneath another, secret and passionate and intense, which is the real life that stamps the faces and gives characters to the voices of our friends. Always in his mind, each member of these social units is escaping, running away, trying to break the net which circumstances and his own affections has woven about him. One realizes that human relationships are the tragic necessity of human life. They can never be wholly satisfactory, that every ego is half the time greedily seeking them and half the time pulling away from them. In those simple relationships of loving husband and wife, affectionate sisters, children and grandmother, there are innumerable shades of sweetness, sweetness and anguish which make up the pattern of our lives day by day. Number three, beauty and meaning are there. If only we can see it. Well, I grew up in North Platte, Nebraska, and received my bachelor's degree from Hastings College, 
a campus only an hour's drive from where Cather grew up. I know you've heard part of this story now, but I'm going forward with it anyway. <laughs> I majored in English, but I had no interest in reading Willa Cather. I thought all that pioneer stuff was deadly boring. I had no idea what her works were really like, and I had a stack of assumptions and stereotypes that prevented me from learning. Wrapped up in those assumptions that I had when I was a fairly foolish young man was the belief that any art that was to be taken seriously, I mean really seriously, had to come from France or Ireland or New York or at least Chicago. I mean, it sure as hell couldn't come from Nebraska where, where I was from, right? When I was working on my master's degree at the University of Missouri, Columbia, I was assigned to read a Willa Cather short story in an American literature class. It was Neighbor Rosicky, sometimes pronounced Neighbor Vizicki, but I'll say Rosicky a story set among farming people in 1920s Nebraska. This story hit me hard. The lives of these obscure people are presented with vitality and complexity. Their simple kindnesses are made profound, not through flowery language, but through subtle evocation of emotion and a basic respect for their dignity and importance as people. Let me share a passage from early in the story when Anton Rosicky, an aging farmer, is driving his wagon home and stops to look at the graveyard that is at the edge of his land. It was a nice graveyard, Rosicky reflected, sort of snug and homelike, not cramped or mournful, a big sweep all around it. A man could lie down in the long grass and see the complete arch of the sky over him, hear the wagons go by. In summer, the mowing machine rattled right up to the wire fence, and it was so near home. Over there across the corn stalks, his own roof and windmill looked so good to him that he promised himself to mind the doctor and take care of himself. He was awfully fond of his place, he admitted. He wasn't anxious to leave it. And it was a comfort to think that he would never have to go farther than the edge of his own hayfield. The snow falling over his barnyard and the graveyard seemed to draw things together like and they were all old neighbors in the graveyard, most of them friends. There was nothing to feel awkward or embarrassed about. After reading this story, I soon read other works, and I discovered that Cather's unironic appreciation of human lives, of the impulses and affections and fears that shape them, is one of her greatest gifts as an artist. Though her books often feature remarkable people, their distinction is typically found through their ability to accept their own true selves. Anton Rosicky's farm, we learn in the story, is not that big or profitable. His family does not get on as fast as some neighbors. They consume their cream instead of selling it for profit. They decide to have a picnic when they realize the heat has ruined their corn crop. But they're kind to one another and unconcerned about their lack of wealth. Maybe the local doctor reflects, quote, people as generous and warm-hearted and as affectionate as the Rosickys never got ahead much. Maybe you couldn't enjoy your life and put it into the bank too. It wasn't until Cather was nearly 40 years old that she really committed to narratives set in a place and among a community that she reflected was very unfashionable. The very name of Nebraska, she wrote, quote, throws the delicately attuned critic into a clammy shiver of embarrassment. <laughs> Beginning in earnest with her novel, O Pioneers, in 1913, Cather created books that defied this fashion and represented Nebraska and the Great Plains with depth literary sophistication, and an implicit insistence that life in Nebraska had as much drama, nuance, and mythical weight as life anywhere on the planet. Of course Nebraska is a storehouse for literary material, she told an interviewer in 1921. Everywhere is a storehouse for literary material. If a true artist was born in a pig pen and raised in a sty, he would still find plenty of inspiration for his work. The only need is the eye to see. Willa Cather had the eye to see. And in representing that vision, she empowered others to see as well. That interviewer in 1921 felt it. She writes, quote, the longer Miss Cather talks, the more one is filled with a conviction that life is a fascinating business and one's own experience more fascinating than one had ever suspected it of being. Number four, learn more or less all the time. In the fall of 1908, Willa Cather was the new managing editor at McClure's Magazine, one of the top magazines in the country. She had left a teaching job in Pittsburgh in order to move to New York and take a position with the magazine, and ultimately, the job helped her launch her professional writing career. It helped by putting her into contact with the literary world and by publishing her creative work. 
but also by reinforcing for her the value of a life experience that makes ample space for growth and development, what Cather called, quote, a right to live and reflect and feel a little. She wrote those words in a letter to the author Sarah Orne Jewett in December 1908. She had become friends with Jewett while she was in Boston working on a McClure's assignment, one of those connections that helped her writing career. And the long, beautiful letter she wrote that December is one of Cather's fullest expressions of her desire to free herself from stimulating but shallow experiences in order to claim a life of meaning. She writes that to do her job, she has to, quote, go at it with a sort of energy most people have to exert only on rare occasions. Consequently, I live just about as much during the day as a trapeze performer does when he is on the bars. It's catch the right bar at the right minute or into the net you go. I feel all the time so dispossessed and bereft of myself. Of course, there are interesting people and interesting things in the day's work, she continues, but it's all like going around the world in a railway train and never getting off to see anything closer. Now, the kind of life that makes one feel empty and shallow and superficial, that makes one dread to read and dread to think, can't be good for one, can it? It can't be the kind of life one was meant to live. I do think that kind of excitement does to my brain exactly what I have seen alcohol do to men's. It seems to spread one's very brain cells apart so that they don't touch. <laughs> Cather observed that the constant stimulus of deadlines and office drama would not be sustaining to her. And only a few years later, after refreshing herself with a leave from McClure's and a trip west to Arizona and Nebraska, she left the magazine and published O Pioneers, the novel that would in earnest begin her life as a professional creative writer. What she was seeking, she told Jewett in 1908, was a life that gave her intellectual space to think and to grow. She knew that to be the, she knew that to be the kind of writer she wanted to be. She had to claim such a space. She had been able to, quote, learn more or less all the time, she said, while teaching in Pittsburgh, when she also produced important short stories like Paul's case and the sculptor's funeral. And she'd be able to do so again during her life as a novelist. In ways big and little, Cather's whole life can be seen as an effort to keep learning. She was engaged, she was curious, she was reflective, and she surrounded herself with other people who shared those qualities. Thomas Lyon, in his essay, Willa Cather Learner, writes that, quote, to learn in the sense that I'm outlining is not at all to gather knowledge or discrete facts, but rather a continuing unsettlement and opening of the consciousness as a whole, the power to relate, to see inside, to feel with another. Cather resisted a hardening of thought and embraced expansion, development. She threw aside the habits that could lull one into complacency, complacency what in my Antonia she called, quote, a life made up of evasions and negations and instead opened herself to new possibilities. Because Cather was not a hedonistic sensation collector, like many of her modernist contemporaries, some casual observers, I think, have understood her as conservative. They read her rather ordered life as a reflection of a settled mind. Instead, I think her ordered life gave her space to unsettle her mind because she did not get consumed with affairs or drinking problems and social status, she managed to produce novel after novel that artfully, subtly reflected a profound consideration of human experience. She grew as an artist and as a person. This growth can be measured in multiple ways, but I wanna look at two examples that speak to the expansion of her perspective and sensitivities. In 1915, Cather published The Song of the Lark, which I've mentioned before, a narrative of a woman's growth into a major artist. Cather's focus early in her career is on success. It's on greatness. The whole of the novel builds to achievement. And the central character, musician Thea Kronberg, is a dynamo of strength, will, and talent. It's a beautiful book about tremendous artistic accomplishment, one that takes Kronberg from a small Midwestern town to Chicago and eventually the Metropolitan Opera in New York. 20 years later, Cather published Lucy Gayhart. This book is also about a young, talented, motivated woman from a small Midwestern town that goes to Chicago to study music. However, Cather's sense of what this skeletal narrative means has greatly changed. Or to put it another way, Cather has returned to familiar ground to demonstrate an alternative view of the story. Lucy Gayhart is, in some ways, about plans going unfulfilled, and it is centered on a woman that lacks Thea Kronberg's focus and energy. 
As Cather developed, she became interested in human frailty and the subtle ways strength manifests itself in our lives. Lucy Gayhart does not end with achievement, but with a meditation on living day to day in full awareness of one's own humility. Harry Gordon, a character who has been reflecting on the last time he saw Lucy Gayhart, looks up at the stars. These things he had been remembering mattered very little when one looked up there at eternity. And even on this earth, time had almost ceased to exist. The future had suddenly telescoped out of the past, so there was actually no present. Kingdoms had gone down, and old beliefs of men had been shattered since that day when he refused Lucy Gayhart a courtesy he wouldn't have refused the most worthless old loafer in town. The world in which he had been cruel to her no longer existed. Cather's unsettling of an early narrative art shows us her expanding sense of human experience and where to locate the meaning of that experience. And to give a second and final example of Cather's capacity for growth, I want to briefly compare two efforts to create characters with life experiences outside of Cather's own. Cather's 1918 novel, My Antonia, contains a brief scene of an African-American musician performing in a local hotel. The character, Blind Darno is a sympathetic one, but Cather's language describing him indulges in essentialist, racist rhetoric common to the period. He is depicted as a vital musician, but somewhat simple-minded, as if his whole human self is manifest in his performance for a wide audience. It's an ugly moment in a beautiful book. 20 years later, when Cather decided to write a novel based on her family history in Virginia, she confronted her own ignorance of African-American life. The seed for this novel, Safira and the Slave Girl, was a memory from childhood when Cather witnessed the reunion of Nancy, a woman who had escaped slavery, and her mother, Matilda Jefferson. To construct this narrative, she delved into research on life in antebellum Virginia, the Underground Railroad, and the Middle Passage. Though she drew heavily upon her memories in constructing the novel, her reading and maturing mind allowed her to reinterpret those memories with deeper empathy and humility. The African-American characters in this novel are not hollow stereotypes like Blind Darno, but reflect Cather's attempt, one that was, of course, not completely successful, to fully imagine the lives of enslaved people. As Toni Morrison wrote at the end of her consideration of Cather's novel, quote, in returning to her childhood, at the end of her writing career, Cather returns to a very personal, indeed private experience. In her last novel, she works out and toward the meaning of female betrayal as it faces the void of racism. She may not have arrived safely, like Nancy, but to her credit, she did undertake the dangerous journey. And number five, have the courage to be honest and free. At the end of January 1947, just a few months before she died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage, Cather wrote a letter to the Canadian critic E.K. Brown, who would later become her first biographer. The letter is full of little details, complaints about a new expurgated edition of Shakespeare, memories of meeting Justice Louis Brandeis, recalled conversations with the British critic William Archer, and she ends the letter with this observation. We learn a great deal from great people. The mere information doesn't matter much but they somehow strike out the foolish platitudes that we have been taught to respect devoutly and give us courage to be honest and free, free to rely on what we really feel and really love, and that only. Of all we've inherited from Cather, it's this vision that is for me one of the most important. Through her life and through many of her characters, she demonstrates the power and joy in self-acceptance. As the phrase in this letter indicates, an honest reckoning with oneself takes a measure of courage and a good deal of practice, but with acceptance comes liberation. Self-assuredness was present in Cather from an early age, something she had access to because of the good luck of being born into a family that provided a reasonable degree of economic security and a generous amount of love and attention. When she was 14, she signaled her difference from her peers when she noted in a friend's autograph album that her favorite amusement was vivisection, and her, her pet hobbies were snakes and Shakespeare. Later, unlike most young women in Nebraska, she went to the university, this university, and continued her learning. While in Lincoln, she also began to earn money in writing and journalism. She financially supported herself and others with these skills for the rest of her life, proclaiming to a friend while working in Pittsburgh, quote, oh, I have grown enamored of liberty, to be wholly free, to really be of some use somewhere, to do with one's money what one likes, to help those who have helped me, to pay the debts of one's love, 
one's loves and one's hates. Cather's romantic and sexual attachments, her loves were women rather than men. And surviving letters suggest she was open about this part of herself too, joking with Mary Elgear in 1893 that she had bruises from, quote, deriving a certain fair maid. This was Louise Pound, on whom Cather had a crush in college. Over the country, quote, over the country with one hand, sometimes indeed with no hand at all. As Cather matured, she had no apparent habit of making explicit comments on her love life and letters, but she did not try to hide it either. Her profound attachment to Edith Lewis, for example, with whom she lived for 38 years, is present everywhere. In correspondence with family, friends, and associates, Edith Lewis is mentioned regularly, and their intimacy is illustrated openly in simple gestures, as when they together sent Cather's niece a wedding present. Though Cather suffered from self-doubt and insecurity like all of us, she did not indulge it, and she managed to live her life largely free from crippling neurosis. She made a commitment to be honest and free. And she brought into literature characters with humble backgrounds who are ennobled by their ability to live an authentic life. Consider Antonia Shamer de Cusack from Cather's My Antonia. The power of the character, the achievement of Antonia, is her full possession of herself. At the end of the novel, Jim Burden, the narrator, reflects on the indefinable quality within her that so moves him. She was a battered woman now, not a lovely girl, but she still had that something which fires the imagination, could still stop one's breath for a moment by a look or gesture that somehow revealed the meaning in common things. She had only to stand in the orchard to put her hand on a little crab tree and look up at the apples to make you feel the goodness of planting and tending and harvesting at last. All the strong things of her heart came out in her body that had been so tireless in serving generous emotions. Cather's art lifts up human qualities that are simultaneously rare, yet accessible to all of us. Our inheritance, one we should acknowledge as sacred, is Cather's vision of a meaningful, a connected, expansive, diverse, and honest human life. Thank you very much. Sure. We're going to have a little time for Q&A. Uh, this is Mohammed Dahab. I'm in the Department of Civil Engineering and uh, had the privilege to chair the uh, Re University Research, Research Council this year. And uh, I looked forward to this presentation because uh, it really is a truly fascinating look into the life and work of one of America's most noted citizens. Uh, Again, on behalf of the Research Council, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. And thank you to Ronnie Green for taking the time out. I know you can be in a lot of other places. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also thank you for continuing this program. This is a, this is a wonderful program. Uh, part of the Research Council is that we get to read all the, uh, uh, all the uh, material submitted, and uh, it's not easy to, uh, it's not easy to, uh, really come up to a, a conclusion sometimes, but this time it was pretty easy. <laughs> uh, this time we uh, have a chance to interact with Andy with questions uh, or comments if you have them, because we have uh, people on the uh, cyberspace with us, I think, I think we need to use the microphone to the ex extent possible. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. I'll be happy to bring you the microphone and I'll try to cover everyone. And if I don't, just yell at me or wave a little uh, stronger. Thank you. Uh, Andy, thank you. If I may, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> please. And we're done. No. <laughs> uh, the pesky engineers, you know. Uh, please, uh, for everyone, we would appreciate it if you introduce yourself to the rest of the audience. Um, hello, I'm Mark Reap from the chemistry department at the university, and I want to thank you for a great talk and giving us an insight into what drove her and how her life is uh, informing us today, 100 years later. But um, you may know that I have studied the history of the chemistry department at the university, 
the first yep, 25 years. And I like turning everything into the history of the chemistry department. Go for it. Um, you did mention Mariel Gear, who was Willa Cather's friend. So I actually have yes. two questions. OK, I'll do my best. Uh, when Willa Cather came to the university, did she intend to become a chemistry major or a biology major? And then number two, uh, when did she start her friendship with Mariel Gear? And I know she interacted with her a long time. She wrote letters to her a long time. Right. Is she her most common correspondence? OK, I'll try. Um, and there may be others in the room who might have something to say about this, too. But I I liked, I believe. Yep, I think I have a lapel. So uh, when she came here, she did want to be a doctor. I don't know if she declared a chemistry or biology. I don't know that even she declared anything. Um, she pretty early on uh, switched over to a different vocation. Um, Mariel Gary is one of the very important correspondents, but not the most voluminous. Um, but one thing that is distinctive about Mary Algier's correspondence is the range of years it covers. Because it started when they were in college, the correspondence is especially rich during those years and in the years when Catherine first went to Pittsburgh and wrote back to her friends in Lincoln. And then later they didn't seem to correspond quite as much. But it's a very important correspondent with Catherine. So, thanks. I'm Kari Ronning, and I just wanted to say that Cather did take a class from Rachel Lloyd, who was chemistry professor oh, yeah. at the university in the 1890s. So. This is why I work with Kari. <laughs> I'm Chuck Hi. Schroeder I, uh, with the Rural Futures Institute at the university, which has actually nothing to do with my interest in Cather. <laughs> uh, number one, uh, exceptionally well done. Uh, number two, thank you for legitimizing those of us who avoided Cather as 17 and 18 year olds because we thought it was just the chronicles of the pioneers that we'd yeah. heard since birth. I thought you made a profoundly important statement in the interview actually uh, leading up to this about discovering Cather later and the fact is her work is for adults. Yeah. I'd like for you to talk about the potential for <laughs> those of us adults uh, in the world returning to the study of Cather to really explore uh, how do we take her out of the notion that she's a requisite for 18-year-olds and uh, actually a very legitimate yeah. subject for study later in life. The, the quick way to do that would be re to read the book The Professor's House. Um, it's, and to, show, to, to realize that her concerns were not restricted to one environment or one narrative, that they went all over the place. And The Professor's House is definitely a book about many things, but including about getting older and coming to terms with certain realizations in life. It's, it's not a book that will mean a lot, I think, to younger people. There have been many uh, conferences and things where uh, Cather's reflections on on aging, on mortality. Not that those are the only concerns of older people. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but she's, she's very profound. She kept, she kept thinking about these things, kept writing about them. And even if you returned now, if someone has read My Antonia when they're in high school and have a memory of it, if you go back to now, you'll think it's a different book than you did then. Even students, I've had the experience of students who read it in high school and then read it a few years later in college. And they realize there is something they're connecting to, an emotion within it, uh, insight, a wisdom to it that they did not perceive when they were young. The language is accessible, but the, the themes, the emotions, the uh, ideas are quite deep and they need some experience to fully realize, I think. So thank you for your question and for your comments. Hey, hey. Uh, Matthew Jockers. Um, Annie, there's something bothering me. Oh, good. And you can take the fifth on this if you have to. But, okay. Um, something you said in the talk, you, you sort of, you didn't use the word profound, but I think that's what you meant. The profound change that reading the letters had on you and the way that you thought about Cather. Yeah. And so the question is, is, is this. Cather, as I understand it, didn't want to have her letters published. That's true. And so the persona that she created through her work was perhaps the persona that she wished to have persist into, into history. And so now you've, you've read the letters, the letters are now public record. I'm wondering, how do, you, how do you deal with that as, on the one hand, I recognize as a scholar, I wanna see those letters. Right. How, how do you deal with that? I'll tell you how I do. So I think it is true, and for those who don't know this story, I'll tell it briefly. In Cather's will, which she made in 1943, in the last 
uh, part of her life, a part of her life that was, I think, quite troubling, troubled for her. Um, she made a decision to restrict the publication of um, her letters and the adaptation of her works into other mediums, uh, and among other things. But uh, she never left an explanation for that, um, but she did say she wanted people to know her through her published works, works that she had refined and thought through and polished. Um, when we decided to publish the letters, I've thought about this before. The reason is not unlike what John Neihardt says about the precious heritage that is ours through her. The reason was to privilege the interests of the living over the interests of the dead, really. To think that there was something for those of us who are here and the future generations to get from these materials. Something positive, something enriching. Um, and because of that alone, they are worth doing. And Cather maybe wouldn't have liked it um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it doesn't really matter. No matter what, <laughs> no matter where she is now, I don't think she cares, you know? Because <laughs> um, but I, all, I do think she would appreciate that this has led people to a, a more nuanced, a more accurate understanding of who she was and what she cared about. Because uh, she did care about accuracy. Okay. <laughs> Was there a question over there? Yeah, okay. Hi, Dorothy. I'm Dorothy Anderson, and I just want to take a moment to thank Andy for all the classes he has taught for Ollie. I have been the coordinator for a number of the classes, Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and he's a very popular instructor for us. And again, we just confirm what a lot of people have said. Most of us had read Willa Cather as high school and college students, but when we reread it, uh, 50 and 60 years later, <laughs> a lot of us, we just find a lot more in it. So thank you again, Andy, and thank, thank you. you, the university, for letting Andy teach Ollie classes. <laughs> I hope to do another one soon. My name is Marcia Morell, and I'm an amateur golfer in Nebraska. And I'm interested in Willa Cather's relationship to Louise Pound because in my historic information in Nebraska women's golf, Louise Pound was our first Nebraska women's champion. Did Willa Cather in her life herself experience sport? Um, not golf that I'm aware of. She did ride a bicycle and she did enjoy that. Um, and uh, she, 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 her, her preferred sports I think personally were hiking and biking and sort of be, and being an outdoors person and, and, and riding and, you know, am I missing any? Um, but she didn't play competitive sports ever, I'm aware of, but she did know many that did. You know, Louise Pound is an excellent example. Yeah. She ice skated. Oh, and she ice skated, yes. that's right. Dorothy Anderson again. Andy, you're forgetting to mention she was also a sports writer while she was in college. Oh, yeah. Because she has a right. wonderful review of the bug eaters playing. She did it's write about football one. when she was in college. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Among other things. Well, thank you very yes, much for you. your interactions. I, uh, uh, just a quick uh, bit of information. Uh, I was told by Mary Greer from the research office that we have 16 nominations this year for next year's uh, lectures. So uh, we look forward to uh, a very, uh, very exciting uh, program. And this time, I guess I'll give the microphone to the chancellor. Well, first of all, please join me in congratulating Andy for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And as is our tradition in the Nebraska lectures, there is a framed print here for you, okay, thank you. of the poster for today's lecture for you to remember this. And I'm sure if Ms. Cather was here today, she would say, well done. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you.